All right, let's start again. Yeah, so the title of this talk is maybe a bit confusing, um, but I guess we'll get into that because it's come about some of the work that I've done at AG Grid um, in preparing our Angular component for our, our grid library. Um, so these are some of the things that I've learned along the way if you want to make your component nice to use for people um, if they're doing if their application is using all the template template type checking so if we have a look at this so by default all new angular applications come with template template checking and strict mode turned on and what that enables i guess your compile your ide say like visual studio code or intellij to do is have these you know red squiggly lines and warn you about types being wrong. So here we're trying to pass a string into something which we think is a Boolean. And um, so this is a really nice way of us getting compile time errors in our code. So we want our users of our components to be able to take advantage of this. Um, and this is something which, you know, you might be thinking, OK, that's simple enough. I know about types and TypeScript. So if this is a Boolean property, I'm just going to set it as a Boolean. But surprisingly, that's not always enough. And this is something which I ran into when working on our AG Grid component, because previously everything was typed as any. So all our users didn't get any advantage of, you know, us being able to say the row data property is an array of, of data or these Boolean switches, they are actually Boolean values. So what I did is set all the types as as I thought they should be set. So for like disabled, it was just a Boolean. But then what happened is we ran into situations um, where that wasn't good enough. So it's fine when you're using an attribute like this. So you're saying disabled with the square brackets and you pass it a Boolean value and that works and it's type checked as, as a Boolean. But then what if somebody is using a plain attribute like this? And this is something which is quite common um, across components and HTML elements themselves. It's just to say disabled. I just want to disable it. But if you do this, you'll get this error, which you can see in the middle of the slide. It's saying the type of string is not assignable to type Boolean. And, and this is because what you're actually doing when you put a disabled attribute on like that, is that that gets converted to square brackets and then an empty string. So that's where this error message is coming from and why when you're using an attribute like that, what, your com what the component is actually receiving is an empty string, which I guess isn't a Boolean. And that's where this topic kind of comes from. It's like, well, our component isn't really ready for strict mode because we have we're not supporting all the ways that users might want to, I guess, interact and configure our component. So what this leads us on to is something called input coercion. And that's what we need to do if we want to support plain attributes for Boolean inputs. And there's two approaches depending on your Angular and TypeScript version um, for how to go about this. So in Angular versions 9 to 14, there's a static type um, and static property, and I'll show you how to use it, called ng-accept input type underscore, and then you give it a property name. And that's the way that we've had to solve this, prob solve this problem up until Angular version 13. But with Angular 13, TypeScript 4.3 has come out, and setters and getters are now allowed to have different types. So we'll look at both of these approaches because I know that many applications are still, you know, between versions 9 to 13 or 9 to 12, and you haven't been able to upgrade them yet to 13, 14. So it's important for us to know both of these approaches. So if we look at ng except input type, so this is a static property supported by Angular um, so that it can give extra information to the compiler, which does the, the type checking as you're coding. And what you can do with this is, 
widen the type that this input property is expecting. So you define your input in exactly the same way. So we're saying, you know, it's a disabled and it's a Boolean and we give it a default value of false. But then we also add this static property to the class called ng accept input type underscore disabled. And then it's the disabled name which is matching up with the input property. So that's how these two are linked. And then you can see that we're typing that as a Boolean or an empty string. So once we've done that, it now means that our code compiles. Because now we're saying actually this type, this input can have a type Boolean or it can be the empty string. So now that disabled attribute is working, but we haven't quite finished yet because now we have to remember to convert the empty string to be true. And that's where this idea of input coercion comes in. Now we can do this um, via ng on changes. So you can see when the changes is for disabled, we've got this coercion function to Boolean, which will take that current value, which we know to be a Boolean or a string, in this case, the empty string. And we can say this dot disabled. So if the value is exactly the empty string or it is true, then we set disabled to true. So in that way, we've enabled people to use that plain attribute instead of always having to specify the full square brackets and giving it the value. And it's, this doesn't just work for Booleans. You could have a situation where you might want to use this for dates as well. So for example, here we've got a date input. And once again, we're going to use ng accept input type underscore date to match up the property of the input name. But this time we're going to say it's either a date or a string. And then in ng on changes, when we get changes to the date, we can run that through a to date coercion function. So that might be quite a good way of your component being able to handle strings or dates for your date inputs. Because quite often we'll get string representations of dates from our APIs. So that's, you might be thinking that's okay, that's, that's good. Are there any other cases where you might need to do some input coercion? And the, another use case for this is the async pipe. So say we've now got this, our same disabled property, but we want to be able to set it from a observable stream. So instead of just having a static property, true or false, we're going to have some stream of data which is telling us when to disable this component or not. And so with us, that same disabled input, and we try and set it up with the stream, so disable stream and we use the async pipe, we now get a new error saying type null is not assignable to type boolean or empty string. So it's like, well, you might be thinking, where's this, where's this null, null pipe coming from? And that's because before a stream has emitted any values, it, it has the value null. Um, so it might be that your stream you know, is still waiting for input from the from an API call or it's or you've got some timer which hasn't emitted yet. And so the type for, for the async pipe has this null in it, which we need to be able to handle. So once again, we can come back to our ng accept input type for the disabled property, and we could just add null onto the the list of properties that this extends or this supports. And then make sure that our to Boolean coercion function correctly handles null. Um, and then our code will compile again um, against that using the async pipe. So that's that's ng accept input type. But then as I was saying, from version 13 of Angular, you now have access to TypeScript 4.3. And with TypeScript 4.3, what you're now enabled to do is have different properties or different types for a getter and a setter. So it might be best if we look at this example. So we've got a get for our input now called disabled, and that returns a, a private property, which is a Boolean. That's this dot underscore disabled. But we've also got a setter now for disabled, which accepts a Boolean, a string or null. And you can see those types match up with what we have required from our previous example. So we want to be able to set this via an attribute and we want to be able to set this from a async pipe. 
and then we're going to set that value via this taboolean coercion function. And so the good, the good thing about this is that it's now completely standard TypeScript code. Angular doesn't has, have to provide us with this special magic um, constant or static, you know, ng accept input type. And so that's why they've deprecated it. And I think it will actually be removed in version 15. So once you're on the more recent versions of TypeScript, I'd recommend using this approach with the get and set for your inputs to be able to handle the input coercion. So that's all good if we're in charge of writing the component ourselves. Um, but what if it's not our component that we're having to, to work with and they haven't done all these things for us? So for example, let's say that disable flag is just a Boolean and we want to use it with a stream. So we could use the non-null assertion. So that's the you know, exclamation mark at the end of the, of the brackets. And so we're basically saying to the compiler, I'm telling you that this is never going to be null. And that might be true if you're disabled, if you're in control of that disabled stream and say it's a behavior subject, for example, and you've given it that first default value. Um, but really that's the responsibility on you is there to, to make sure that actually that isn't going to return a null value. Or you can just completely disable the compile, compile, compiling or the type checking for that by using this dollar any and then putting the type in brackets that you want to ignore. And then Angular just won't type check that. Or another option for you is just to provide a default value. So if the stream hasn't fired yet, you could just default, default to a false value. And you know that might be the safest and also the most kind of readable solution for you to work, work around this. Because you've, you've got no guarantee really that that external component correctly handles nulls if its property is just typed as a Boolean. And if you're finding that maybe a whole suite of components from a library um, doesn't really handle nulls well, then you might want to have a look at your Angular compiler options in the tsconfig file and you can be a bit more, you know, okay, let's turn off null input types for the whole of this application. Or you can go even further and just stop, you know, doing strict input types. But if possible, I'd say don't, don't disable these features because they're there to help us write clean and accurate code. And there's a link here in the slides which takes you to the Angular angular docs on all the different TS config properties that you can set. But then also another thing which you can do if it's not your component is create an issue for the library to fix their types. And that's something which almost happened with us because when I released um, this new version, I set up all the component properties, the inputs and outputs just to use their standard types um, and then quickly realized when I was working through our examples that we were about to get a flood of of issues people complaining that the types don't work and that's what led me to discover all these extra properties to make sure that your component is um, going to play nicely with strict applications and then maybe this is a slightly different concept but something i wanted to add in because i think it's it's quite a nice feature to know about is that if you find for your components that your input is accepting maybe a string, a Boolean, a number, and you've got all these different types which are consistent between inputs and outputs, then you might be wanting a generic component. So what you can do with this is you can have a component in Angular and make it generic. So here we're saying I've got this generic component and it will accept some T data. So some type of our data, so that could be a Boolean or a number. And you can set this for your inputs and outputs, and they can be automatically tied together by the Angular compiler. So that then if somebody is using your component and they're saying, well, my row data is a number, and then my on row data updated function, which they've assigned to your output, that's now a string array. It can say, well, actually, I'm expecting the same data type for this input and that output and they should, they should match up. 
So that's something, another way you can configure your component inputs and outputs in a way that gives your users a really nice, nice experience. Are there any questions at that point or I've got some code examples I can I can run through. Any question from you guys? Yeah, I think I have a very quick question. Um, so, uh, Stephen, uh, with the I think it's the current uh, Angular V13, right? So, for instance, you have um, um, a property of, let's say, of type, <clears throat> I don't know, car, right? And you don't really want to instantiate um everything like is it a must that you instantiate that property or you could just say it's of type car or undefined yeah so as in is this within within a component itself so as yes. in so yes. what you could have an input and this could be a car and the car is some interface yes yes um so. yeah so as in you can have that as car or undefined um to, to represent oh. the fact that that is that what you mean? Yes, yes. Like, is it is it okay to do that instead of um, wanting to instantiate the whole thing? Let's say that your car interface is quite long, right? So you don't have uh, and like you. So for example, you'd be forced to instantiate every single property of that um, of that interface, right? Like, but then probably you don't want to do that. You just want to, you know, it's just going to be of type car or undefined. Like, is that okay? Or should you go the extra mile and make sure that you instantiate each property of that particular interface? No, I think it's fine to have um, input properties that are that start off undefined. And I think that's quite a normal pattern. Um, so, for example, I guess, you know, we could change that to be Boolean. And I guess you'll have this, you get this error if you've got strict mode saying it has no initializer and is not definitely assigning the constructor, which, you know, you can either put in a non-null assertion to say, that's fine, I'm going to initialize it, or or the user is going to initialize it, but I'm okay with it being undefined. Um, so then you, you probably should do undefined. And if you type that, um. type it that way, then then you know that warning goes away. Okay. And then okay. I guess if this is let's do this. So yeah, so and then if this component, you know, you want to be able to set it up to use that car property, you can do optional chaining like this. Mm -hmm. um, oh, this, sorry, this is an older version. Let me drop this into, um, so I think the version of this is an older version of Angular. I've got another one here. Oops. I believe this will now work. So we can have uh, I'm doing it the wrong way around. There we go. So then you can in your template have this support so that if the car is undefined, it, it won't it won't fail. Um, but when the car is actually defined by the user, then it will display the make. I don't know if that's helpful in terms of what the um as opposed to having yeah. to instantiate a car object. Okay. I 
think my question is that because like uh, I'm like I've I've um, I've, uh, I've come into contact or probably encountered such situations whereby you don't really know how the data will come in because again yes you do have the model of uh, let's say the response right but then you're not really sure if it's always going to be there so um, like I found this based on uh, I, I found this on Stack Overflow about you can either have uh, the type uh, or undefined and you can definitely use the optional chaining so I think my question was around is that okay or is it like bad coding practices you know all that no no I'd say that's what the optional chaining is yeah. is for um because it enables you to write this like more succinct code I mean there's there's quite a few different approaches you could do so you could have an ngif um with you know with a different template um, was it ng container and you could have an ngf on there yeah yeah um, on your car and then then inside of there you, you can be confident that you know your car has all the properties yeah. and ngf i think takes a alternative template mm -hmm. so you could give it a default have you Like this and something like that. So this gives you a way of controlling well if the car hasn't been given to me yet, then um, then just display this default template. So, okay. so it's like along those lines. But yeah, so there's there's a few different ways to handle, I guess, when data hasn't actually been passed to your component yet. Okay. Any other question? I think you can go on. So. I've, um, there's a GitHub repo here, which I've created, um, which I'll, I guess I'll share in the, in the call, um, which has example codes for you when you're using a setter and getter, and when you're using an ng except input type. So that's some of the code that we can see, see here. Um, so if I come back to this component. So we can see um, some of the some of this in action. So this is our display component, and within the app component, we're using that display. And here's the different type properties that we've got, and we're using some, you know, which don't work um, based on their attributes and disabled property. Here we can see that it's not accepting the stream property with the null. Um, so in one sense, we could come in here and say, OK, well, this is is accepting the string type, but we haven't made it accept the async pipe yet, which would be a matter of adding the null value. If we come back to our component, this bit is now fixed. And then this disabled with get set. So this is what doesn't work. So if you try to do this in a version of Angular, say version 12 and below, and say this is a string. I'm using use the same TypeScript version from yeah. It's using the TypeScript version from my VS code instead of the TypeScript version from the application. But if I open up the folder here select the version to match what's in the so here we go the workspace version so you can now see that we've 
it's complaining, saying the get and set accessors must have the same type. So this is why we need this ng accept input type, because before version 4.3, when you're trying to use the get and set method, um, it wouldn't let you. So depending on the version of Angular, there's different approaches for you to take. And then there's some more examples on here to do with with pipes and, and numbers, but I guess maybe it's probably better for you to go through those um, yourself and and play around with them and see, okay, wh where's the error coming from? How can I fix it with with either of these two approaches? I've got a question then if there, there aren't any at the moment. It says, do any of you know um, what AG Grid is or have you used AG Grid? I've personally heard of it, but I've never used it. Never used it. Okay. Oh. Let's see. So this is, so all of this came from my work for, for AG Grid, and because one of the things we do here is we create a JavaScript data grid. Um, but at the same time, we we support all the different frameworks, including including Angular. Um, so if I look at one of these examples, look at the code. So you can see we've got all these inputs and we've got outputs, and and so this is where it was really important to get these typings right. Um, so that people had the flexibility to be able to if I open this up, start seeing to configure the grid, you know, in a way that they're they're used to. So, you know, they might be able to say row selection and use it as a as a plain string themselves. Um, but yeah. So if you need a data grid anyway. I won't go through <laughs> demoing all of AT Grid because there's a lot of features. Um, but that's that's been where this the inspiration for this this talk and this this knowledge came from. Um, yeah. Yeah. Might definitely give it a try to my personal projects. Yeah, so um AG Grid, there's a free version. Um oh. so so you know you're completely it's completely free to use all the community features that we've got um which is a lot <laughs> there's a lot of features that you'll get for free and it's just an MIT, MIT license so you can download it and start using it um so you've got sorting spanning pinning animations road dragging all these different ways of like styling the grid um so it's just more when you get down into like some of the different filtering most of them is community, so you would get that for free again. Um, but then we've got licenses for when you want to do row grouping and, and aggregation. But in terms of a data grid, which is free to use with you know, really good features and very good support for Angular, um, then yeah, I'd, I'd recommend it, especially as the community version you can just use. Yeah, and... and uh... Does, does it like does it deploy things like the Angular CDK like like the dragging and dropping like does it use that in the behind the scenes? No, so behind the scenes it's a JavaScript data grid. Oh, um, okay. So all of that, all of that code and that complex logic is all handled in in JavaScript. Um, but you you sit between as an Angular component that handles all the interactions between your application and the the underlying JavaScript data grid. Uh, so yeah, so it's not using Angular features. So that's and that's how the grid can then, you know, support JavaScript, Angular, React, and Vue. So all the same core logic is used, um, but they have different final renderings um, at that last in you know, that last level. Um, I had 
one more question. Sort of yeah. it. Um, but, but, but I think it's still back on the strict typing. Uh, yeah. Probably for those who maybe not really know why should I go for strict typing rather than just use any. Like, what, what can you tell them about that? Okay. Um, I guess let's try and do that in this give an example of, of why that might go wrong. Um, I'm just trying to think whether this is the best example. Let's, um, if I get this running, hopefully I haven't got too many. Um, so the, the reason to have strict typing is to help you catch errors while you're building your application. Um, so let me just get this compiling. Okay. Okay, so we've got um, some very basic uh, rendering going on here. But say we had, so this is our, our app component, and we've got this app display. So something which could easily, very easily happen is that you would do something like this, where like you were, you were hoping to pass it true or false, um, say true. Um, but you accidentally passed it a string. So straight away we're saying, oh, actually, you know, there's something, I've done something wrong here. Um, and so you can fix it immediately. But if you didn't have these, these like types on, um, if we come to our component and we just said, well, that's any. If we come back here, Oh, I've still got the um, ng accept input time. So yeah, so we've set this to same property to any because we, we, you know, we're not doing that typing. And you can see now we're potentially just missing the fact that we've got a bug here um, because we're passing a string instead of a boolean property. So that I mean that's uh, one of the things. Because we might have here, um, let's say, see how this works. Okay, so if it is disabled, then we should see should see that text. So we've got. This is disabled. If I, why is it changing? Okay. Ah, it was that one with the stream, which was. Let's just take that out for simplicity and come back and we say, okay, this is disabled. Um, so we come back here and then think, well, actually, I don't want to disable it. I'm going to set that to false. And what we can see is this is still here. And that's because the string value is getting interpreted as, well, there's something there, so it's so it's true. Um, whereas what I'm expecting is if we set this to the Boolean, you can see it's, it's no longer there. So, so this is the kind of thing that typing can help you catch um, while you're writing the code, as opposed to then, you know, looking at your your application and the output and saying, okay, something's not matching up. Uh, I think we have Paul as a question. Hey Paul, can you just unmute uh, yourself? Hello, Stephen. Hi. Uh, Thank you for the talk. Uh, quite uh, interesting stuff to learn here. 
Uh, so I just had a question follow up from Wayne's question about uh, setting the type to any. Um, what would be the difference if uh, someone just sets it the type as a union type just from the beginning without uh, having uh, used you know, the accept type or anything like that? Okay, yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. So let's do that. So we want to set it to this union. So if we if we do that, uh, yep. that will that will work, um, and I'm, we can probably pass it a pipe as well. But the thing is, it's not quite as um, potentially quite as clean. So here, when we're hovering over it, we think, okay, so there's a boolean. It's either a, people might get confused. They might think that's just a string as opposed to a special case, you know, empty string and then null. They might be like, well, why well, why does it accept null? Um, so it, it's kind of more like of a developer experience, really, that you might have that um, because it, your intent really is for this to be a Boolean. So if, but if you do it this way, you'll see you hover over this. And oh, why is it not? What I'm expecting to see is that this will come up now just saying it's a Boolean. Let's restart the type for its server. This is all right. Letting me down. Oh, that's unfortunate. So, yeah, I definitely have this sometimes when uh, it seems like the Visual Studio will stop showing you the. Uh, the hints. The code it all looks good. Yeah, um, and also your. So it's kind of like that notion of saying, well, this is what I expect from the user for this property, um, as opposed to showing them all the edge cases, which they might then think are, I guess, you know, what it what it would accept. Um, but yeah, as in that is another another way of, I guess, working around it. There might be some other reasons which um, I've missed, um, which you know, which why the Angular team I guess created this this flag for us, um, and I'll try and think of think of what those are in the meantime. I think the main one could just be confusion. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that. Thank I, you, I have a question. Wayne, are you talking? No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so my question is um, I don't know whether this is related to your talk, but um, let me just go ahead. Um, is optional uh, chaining a good practice and how can it be handled by strict typing? So I would say that optional chaining, I am, um, it help, it's, it's really more just about its syntactic sugar. Um, so it, it shortens the amount of code that you, that you have to write. Um, I don't know if I still got the car example around. Maybe not. That's all right. Um, but yeah, so if we have this, let's just 
get it back might be easier to talk through. And let's have an this might just help us show it a bit more. Uh, just making up some things here. So, so let's say now, you know, this display component is about displaying these cards and we've got this interface for it. So we've got make model and it's got this sub object of part and the, and the age. Um, so this is where if I write it first, you know, before we had optional chaining supported in the templates, you know, it would be something along these lines you'd see. You would maybe have car or um, I think you could do it this way. So then if the car is defined, then it's the part defined. And if that's defined, age. Otherwise, let's just do the empty string. which is quite hard to read. <laughs> uh, so it'd be something along these lines. Um, maybe not. Okay, maybe that's not quite supported, but Let's say it was in a method here. So as in before optional chaining, um, you'd have to do something along these lines, um, which is really quite uh, messy. Um, whereas the optional chaining just enables us to you know, do that as you know, safely, um, but that's the equivalent. Um, so now that Angular supports that in our um, templates as well, is, is really nice because then it means you don't have to do all this either oring or or checking you know is this part of the object valid before then checking well is this sub part of the object valid um so i wouldn't so i'd say everything you can do with optional chaining it was possible to do before um but you just had to write a lot more code um so yes yeah, so no i wouldn't I wouldn't say that that's a particularly bad um, practice. Sorry. Using the wrong part. Um, OK. Thank you. Any question? Any question? Probably just uh, add, to add on to what Stephen mentioned. I think, yeah, um, optional chaining, uh, it makes it very, very easy to, you know, for, say, for example, uh, if you look at the interface of car, right, and then define like uh, car interface uh, when it comes to the path, but maybe the path is optional, right? And 
maybe want to show for example if it's there so Oxford said you do that instead of just uh i should say like let's find the dog because sometimes you don't want just to just to print nothing you want to either print something or don't print something that is like a topic in one yeah, I think it's, it's it's a pretty nifty thing uh, uh, coming from uh, ES6. Uh, and when I saw it in Angular, I was like, oh yeah. Because I remember I wrote an article about it at some point. And it was really, really fun, like writing about it. Like this. And currently, like I, I work with uh, like huge data. So optional training, I like, really comes in handy, especially for such cases where you you don't really expect the data to be there, but then just in case it's there, show something. If not, just remove everything out of the zone. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Wayne. Um, is there anyone else has a question? Question or comment? Or suggestions? Paul, do you have a comment? Oh, just following up. It's really, I'm really learning new things and it's really interesting. So I'm just following up. Cool. Yes, I'm. Um, yes. Yes. Yeah, no, I was, I was just going to say this. This, um, I guess, this kind of feature as well is it's hidden away in the Angular docs, um, yeah, like under this check. template template type checking. Um, so it's like all the way down under Angular tools, Dev workflow, AOT compiler. You know, it's right down here. So these features are often quite hard to to come across unless you've, I guess, either seen them in someone else's code or you fall on the right um, Stack Overflow post. Yeah. Um, so that's why, it, you know, this is something which I then I learned about and it proved very useful to our component. So I thought maybe there's other people who could benefit as well. Thanks for that. <clears throat> Anyone else for the meeting? I mean, sorry, who was a question? Or a comment. Or a comment. <laughs> okay, there's none. Um, okay, there's none. I think I'll like to say a big thank you to Stephen for taking us session. Uh, I know it's been quite helpful for most of the people who are here uh, who have just attended. Maybe I think I, I even see like new names over here who have attended like this is the first time. So thank you for also coming for this session. Thank you, Stephen, for taking your time to give us this talk. And this is a heads up again. Uh, this recorded session is going to be available for you on our YouTube channel. So in case you'd like to refer to something uh, at the end, or probably later on, you can definitely uh, check it out. And uh, I'll just land with Stephen and see how you can also share with us any extra resources that we may need for, uh, for you guys. So we're just going to put it all inside the, the video description um, on YouTube, and you're definitely going to see all the resources that is required for GitHub repos and any extra resources that come with it. But uh, yeah, I'd like to thank you. Do you have any closing remarks, Stephen? No, no further marks, but yeah, thank you for having me on your on your meetup. Thank you, thank you, and also thank you for uh, for choosing to be part to be part of uh, this community. Very much, really helpful. Thank you. 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 I uh, just want to say thank you. Um, how can we reach you on Twitter and or LinkedIn or something? If you could leave that info, it would be <coughs> helpful. Uh, 
Yeah. Yeah, so I'm on Twitter, I'm scuba dev. Scuba dev. That's me. So that's probably the best way of uh, reaching out to me. Okay. Thank you so much for your session. It was Thank awesome. <laughs> Thank you too. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to say thank you again and on the DVD. And again, the video will be available for you all um, on our YouTube channel by tomorrow afternoon. Thank you for coming and see you next week. Thank you, Steve. Bye. Bye.